Hello and welcome to Innovative Indies, the show where we chat to independent filmmakers who are innovating the film industry. On this episode, we chat to Matt and Tori from Fizz and Ginger, where they share their expertise in the production of feature films, how to get well-known faces and stars into your own projects, and how they managed to shoot a feature film during lockdown with Ian McKellen. Now, without further ado, let's chat with some innovative indies. My first question is, uh, in the film industry, how did you get to where you are today? So uh, so basically, we, we both trained as actors originally. Um, and I, I stopped doing that uh, a while ago. But I, I'd always been making short films since I was a kid. You know, we had you know classic kind of, well, a while ago, sort of video camera where you had the, the whole VHS and you had to edit on the actual VHS. So I had no idea what we were doing. Um, and then, yeah, so I went to drama school. I didn't know any other way of sort of um, going about telling stories. I didn't know sort of filmmaking. I didn't know how to get to that sort of route. And then just as I was doing more and more acting, I just realised I loved the other side of filmmaking. Um, so I carried on making the short films. Um, then we met doing theatre, actually. And ended up doing some more of the directing stuff, stuff. And then we joined up to do uh, a short film back in 2009 called Gad Zombies, um, which was a, a ridiculous um, 18th century zombie comedy um, and we got Ian McKellen involved uh, you know sort of at the end just for, for fun um, and then we just sort of carried on doing it really but a, a lot of we spent a lot of time doing short films which was kind of our film school um, because we didn't know the technical side of things we spent a lot of time um, sort of putting ourselves through that you know and we've made sort of four of our own feature films now and we're still trying to work things out. Like, I trained yeah. as an actor and um, I still am an actor. Kind of came about through wanting to create my own work um, from being an actor who was sort of, you know, waiting for my agent to call with um, mm -hmm. the next casting and actually just getting so fed up and frustrated with that situation. Um, and the necessity to, to create your own work. Um, that's kind of how it all came about. So when I left drama school, I started a um, kind of very, very teeny, uh, low scale theatre company um, where we did kind of open air theatre. And then we sort of left that behind. Um, I was going to say because you don't make much money from theatre, but then don't really make much money from film either so <laughs> but at least the investors do. but at least the investors do so, yeah. exactly being dyslexic um I, I sort of never saw myself being a writer at all um but you from from necessity is and of creating your own work that's kind of how it all began and now you know it's sort of it's an, an amazing skill that um that we've sort of taught ourselves you wrote before um, but it was new to me and it's something that, you know, I sort of really value and, and it's a skill that obviously you're constantly honing. And what I'm not very good with it, with, it in, with the writing side of things is like the editing side of stuff. So once I got a script down, I'm like, okay, so what do we, how do we do things now and change things? Okay. We need to lose 10 pages or something. Right. What do we do? And so we can kind of do the thing that I do as a director on set. Which like, I okay, definitely dun, wouldn't dun, be dun, able dun, to dun, do. Dun, 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 that goes there. But on a script, I'm like, oh, it's just, just words. Words. I think we've been yeah. quite fortunate in that we sort of both have found our um the skills that we are sort of <laughs> lacking yeah yeah the other in, in the other do. yeah so 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 for you know the skills that you sort of are more akin to I then kind of pick up where you left off so so for sure like the kind of the producing side of things the, the budgeting side of things that and all this stuff we, um we, we just taught, taught ourselves yeah. and doing contracts and now we kind of help sort of mentor people and things and we're going Ten years ago, someone asking us to do contracts things or distribution things. Yeah, you know, we just had to learn it out of necessity. Um, so we've always done it our own way as well. So like you know the, the proper way of doing things, we've never really entirely learned what that should, should be, be to be honest. But it works. Still so, finding out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do wonder about like the proper way of doing things because it's like I don't think there is one. I think there's like everyone's just sort of found their own way of doing it uh, I think like the studios have got their ways of doing it but when it comes to independent film it's like everyone's pretty much found their own footsteps yeah, and each project is yeah, complete absolutely. it has to be completely different as well so you you have to adapt for each each project the, the template that we learned on the first one 
does not apply to the course one yeah. you know, at all. I suppose, I mean, there's loads of interesting pieces of, of like your, your backstory there, but one which is, I, I'd say, a huge, huge factor and something that which everyone should be considerate of is the fact that you got to a point where you just made a leap. You just did that sudden kind of, let's just go ahead and make our own stuff, whether it was your own theatre company or if it was, right, I'm going to actually make our own films with my with my acting friends. It's like that leap itself is really scary. And uh, and I think a lot of people are quite resistant to doing those kind of things. I think, yeah. yeah, I think it's 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 that we were we were also very fortunate in that um, after we had made our first short film, it, partly because we had absolutely no clue how the industry worked, what to do, we sort of quite kind of egotistically, I yeah, guess. A mixture of naivety and arrogance, I <laughs> <Yeah>. suppose. Or, <laughs> um, we we hired the Soho screening room for our 15 minute short film and then invited like everyone. Everyone from the industry. I mean, and, like you know, I did you not finance it's, people. Yeah. Like E1 and uh, Lionsgate and you know, I mean people, anyone yeah. that we could think of, we invited to this screening. And um, loads of them turned up. <laughs> I the think majority. probably partly because they were sort of like, What's "What this? is this?" I mean, what we realised is they thought this was a sort of a, like a pilot to sh- or, or to go look. This is what the, yeah. the main feature film is going to be, uh, which we hadn't even thought of. And people kept going, "Okay, great. So when you know when is the when is the finished thing going to be ready?" And, you know, we're like, "Oh, uh, yeah, I hadn't really thought of that." Exactly. No, no, no. Well, no, exactly. So, so, but what that had enabled us to do is suddenly like all of these doors were open to these people that because they'd replied to us and they turned up, we sort of had suddenly made all these contacts. Um, And so from that, um, we met Margaret Matheson, who is a brilliant producer, um, especially when it comes to kind of lower budget indie films. She's very prevalent um, up in Scotland. Well, if I Um, jump in there, the the reason we got her though, because one of the the distributors went, because we were, you know, pretty young, this was a while ago. um, And, you know, we went went and had a chat, this is great. Clearly you have no idea what you're doing. What you need is someone to help you do that yeah i think i know someone who might have to do it here's her email address say i sent her so we were you know so we, we so margaret sort of started studio canal, someone ridiculous it was studio canal, I think, we went yeah. and had a meeting and like we've made one tiny short film uh, that no one's ever gonna do <laughs> so so but margaret worked then worked with us and basically kind of sort of steered us in the right direction told us sort of you know what was yes legit and not and you know like this is sort of how you can vaguely go about doing this the difference between a sales company and a distributor yeah. is at the time we had um you know, no and so things, all of don't. that was really really helpful and then we also uh, met uh, another producer gareth jones who um has worked in the industry for years and years he has comes from a legal side so he sort of has mentored us so much on that side of things um he also comes from a financing and sales background um and so we were very fortunate in that we had these two people who kind of really mentored us um and we are still in contact with today um but i think you know that the the thing is though you sort of you never think half these people are approachable but a lot of the time these people genuinely want to help like a friend of ours who runs a podcast, he said, like, you know, send the elevator back down once you've got to a certain um, sort of level, you know, to, to help. And people, people are genuinely like, yeah, of course, I'll, I'll give you the time to, to, to help a mentor. And we're doing a similar thing with some people at the moment as well, you know. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's definitely possible if you can reach out to people, I think. It's so helpful. You know, people, even if the industry's changed massively from when Margaret was making films in, in the 70s, she's still making films. You know, it's just having that experience of yeah. what things mean for a start and what is yeah. the order of things roughly. Because um, even though, you know, we've just said that actually every film is different and the process is always different and you've got to <laughs> find your route and your path. There are certain things that you just kind of like need to know. Um, and you're right, part of it is just the lingo. You know, some of the stuff that people say we were, I remember one of our first meetings and like their first question was, is it bonded or unbonded? And we were like, what the who does that mean? You know, it was well, we, we said, like, oh, well, we're still working through that. Like, we, and then went home and Googled it. Um, <laughs> we haven't quite decided that yet. Um, you know, and I mean, still to I hold my hands up and I don't, I still don't really understand. Yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, I do, but it's you know, basically like, the money people 
can, if the film's going wrong, they have it's, the opportunity to speak to the director of the project. It's even an if insurance you've written policy. It. It's yeah. an thing, but it makes yeah. it makes getting your finance easier if it is bonded. But, it's, but you know, it's at, at that stage, we were for Amy. It was our first feature film that we were trying to get the finance for, and yes, it was a huge project. Um, and Which looking back now, also. it was too much money yeah. for a first-time director to even think about kind of asking for with no track record. Yeah, we'd, we'd written sort of the feature version of Big Ad Zombies, and that you know, it was 18th century, and we had ships and cords of zombies and things, and we just kind of went, oh, here's our imagination, run wild. And then it took us a few years to realise, well, hang on, I've made a few short films now. Yeah. No one's realistically just going to go, here's... Five million pounds. No million wonder pounds. they were asking whether it was bonded or else. Yeah, so, so who's directing? Oh, it's me. Oh, okay, right. <laughs> Took us a while to go. Um, we need to go and make some calling cards. I think first, yeah, smaller budget. And I think that's that's the thing about so when you said you know like just being brave enough to kind of step up and and yeah. and make that leap and do your first project and just get it done. We always say like n it doesn't mean that everyone in the world has to see it. In fact, actually, you know, maybe it's best if they yeah. don't. Just get it done. Get your first one done. Get your feet wet. See, you know, like start to learn. Just learn. That's because the, the best yeah. way of learning is by doing. And, you know, obviously. I mean, so, I think even if you have been to film school and learned all the technical side of things, there is, that's, it's a bit like drama school. That's a really small portion of what you actually need to learn for the industry. There's mm. all the stuff at the beginning of how you get something financed how you get it distributed as well you know and and those things need to be thought about right at the beginning so you need to have known, know about the distribution idea and how you're going to market this and all this horrible things you don't really want to think about as a creative but absolutely have to at the beginning as well yeah. it's that classic <laughs> thing isn't it that um that every filmmaker wants their film to be for everyone and one of the first questions that a distributor asks you is what's your audience you know and you're like you desperately want to be like well my audience is everyone everyone's going to enjoy my film and it's the reality is no that's just not true or it's a genre um, define uh defying you know you can't put this in a box oh yeah and then so, so the distributors are like well how how do i sell it that's that's what, what toast, is the audience for the, yeah. The yeah which is what we started doing and oh no this this blends so many different things uh, no one's ever seen it before which is also not true um because most things you know yeah a few but, stories in the world um mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. As much as your film, you don't want your film to be in a box, the distributor will want it in yes. a box. So they know they can sell it, so they'll take it on. And, yeah. and the One of the most important factors uh, is is that if you do want your film to be designed for mainstream, is yes, you can make it like that, but you need to be able to almost market it and sell it and, and package it in a very particular way that it can be niched down to a smaller audience, which can build its hype and then it can spread out and then find more more uh, reach that way afterwards. You told me that you have gotten good at doing a lot with a little, which is clearly true when you told me how you shot Infinitum, uh, Subject Unknown. Uh, can you tell us about that and how that process came to be? This started as an experiment, really. Um, of, so it was at the beginning of the lockdown last year. Um, I sort of, I, I'd always, you know, on our other feature films, we'd always use lovely Ari Alexas and obviously a crew and all that sort of stuff. Uh, I'd always wanted to see how far you could push an iPhone to go. So I know other, other filmmakers and Steven Soderbergh and people are using iPhones. Like, okay, well, you know, well, let's see what we can do with it. Um, obviously with this, the, the beginning of lockdown, so we couldn't have a crew. So we had a few crew kind of working remotely but it was basically just the two of us um, on yeah. set. It was day two of lockdown and you were like, right, let's make a film, just the two of us on an iPhone. Um, what should we, what should it be about? And you went down this kind of post-apocalyptic route, which made perfect sense. You know, the streets were completely empty. Edgar Wright had sent, done a tweet saying, I hope there's some indie filmmakers out there who are making use of the yeah. empty streets. And so, and then, but then I remembered that we, years ago, like eight years ago, we'd written a very short film uh, about a woman who wakes up in a van, has no idea where she is, um, and she gets a phone call. And the phone call says, if you can last, if you can survive the next 12 hours, you'll be released. Um, and then, and it kind of, she was kind of stuck in this time loop and it kept resetting back again. And from that very short film, the idea that we had, we'd written a bigger screenplay called Infinitum. And, um, or Infinitum. Or Infinitum. 
it, we sort of built this huge world and you know I mean it is it's big budget um but then I thought well if we took one of the tech subjects the big picture is about um, a, a parallel world is discovered and there is an experiment um, that the UK and American governments run to try and develop a team of agents who are capable of seeing infinite possibilities and if you can see infinite possibilities then you can choose one and therefore alter reality so they're kind of developing some superhero agents basically <laughs> that are capable of of controlling the world so the idea was to basically take one test subject who has got stuck in between the worlds so she's kind of in limbo in this other world she's in the experiment but she doesn't have any recollection of it and she doesn't know why, where she is or what, why she's being reset in this kind of constant time loop. So Infinite and Subject Unknown is the, is the sort of following of this one character on her own as she moves through this completely isolated world to discover this research centre, which is kind of where it all stems from. And that's when she discovers the tapes from the scientists that are played by Ian McKellen and, and Conleth Hill. So that's how we managed to get them into the mix. But, but it, it, this all started as, as an experiment. As a director, I wanted to learn more. I've never actually been behind the camera. So I wanted to learn more about that and, and visual storytelling and motion with the camera. Um, so we can go and have a little gimbal. Um, and then we, we would send the footage to our editor um, every day. And at this point, we didn't think anyone would ever watch it at all. It was purely for us. You know, for Tori as an actor, you know, carrying a, an hour and a half film pretty much by herself, sort of 90% of the screen time. And then our, our editor was going, yeah, this is actually good, guys. And that's, that's high praise for him, to be honest. Um, yeah, well, um, we just carried on going. He was editing as we went along every day, partly to see, you know, technically, um, that's why we're sending him things. You know, one is it making sense? Visually, is the storytelling doing what we think it does um, or should be doing? Because there's not a huge amount of dialogue. It's one character in this entirely empty world. Um, but then also, you know, am I, is it, if I've blown windows out again, is it in focus? All these sort of silly things. Yeah. Have I done something wrong with the settings on the Filmic Pro app? Um, which is brilliant, by the way. Mm. So that's that's how it started. And then, because we've done other films, you know, press people sort of started picking up on the idea. You know, okay, what are Fizz and Ginger Films doing? Um, and it sort of kind of got bigger and bigger. And went, well, we're going to have to sort of show people um, sort of later on. And it turned, yeah, it turned out to be. I mean, it's still an odd film, and it's it's kind of one of those Marmite films. The people who know about it are going, "This is extraordinary." Um, the people who kind of think it's some huge sci-fi film with Ian McKellen on the front poster, <laughs> which is not our doing, um, are sound like this is not this is not the Marvel budget thing I was expecting. So that's an interesting this journey as well. No, this Ian. is not Tenant. No, I think we, we worked <laughs> we out is it? Yeah, we had one and a half seconds worth of the budget of Tenant. So yeah. that's kind of gives you an idea of the budget of it. So yeah, we just had really basic sort of package, and you know, we made sure we had nice sound and, and things like that, and some lights, um, and we just plotted around for sort of five weeks really um six, yeah. six weeks but we as always though we always write around locations that we know that we can get so even when we have a crew and budget we'll always do this anyway to try that's the whole making the most out of things so we'll have a kernel of an idea and then find places that we go well this would be a cool place to film this this these are great locations right let's bend the story um to to work around that rather than having the script then finding locations having to kind of adapt it we will properly write for what is available and let that inform the story so I think so yeah that's how we did it and we did it with the aisle so our film before this which was a much bigger thing is a victorian supernatural thriller on a uh, scottish island we found the island first and then we started looking right, at how we yeah went, okay so looking at the history of the place and some myths and then worked backwards to mine as much as we could out of this um scottish like island basically yeah. With the limitations of what you had, but it's not just the locations, but the fact that you couldn't physically be with another actor to shoot with them. Well, they're going to discover tapes. Like that is a, that is a big part of the film, and to have written that in with those limitations, they're the little things that I think um, a lot of young filmmakers don't go. Oh, we're limited to this, and they just go, oh, throw that idea out the window, then do something else. But you found ways to adapt and include what you could do in the film and to still progress the same storyline. It does mean that it does kind of squash the, the creativity from the script point of view. You know, there are things you go, okay, we'd love to do this, but we just can't. So 
but then that means that you're not um, compromising. There's far fewer, far less compromises when you do it this way around. Mm-hmm. You know, we've been on sets where you go, I really want to do this. If you haven't got the budget, you haven't got the time, you haven't got the equipment or the crew. Okay, so all right, we'll do this then. And you're like, ah, if you just known this at the beginning, written the scene, yeah. written the scene differently, then you could have had a far mm. more interesting scene, absolutely, a bit bigger spectacle, but in a different way, rather yeah. than trying to, you know, rely on, I don't know, cheap SFX or something. Yeah, and uh, I guess whilst we're on the, the the topic of of writing and sort of prepping your script as well, you write for distribution. How do you do that? Well, th- this, this is a fairly newish yeah, idea yeah. for us, to be honest. Though we, it's not what we did at the beginning, and it's only after talking to um, distributors about what they would want as well. Um, well, yeah, I mean, so if we start from the beginning, so go on then. I mean, Missing Her Teens, which was our first film, that um, we that was kind of like a passion project for someone else. Um, it was more is made more as kind of an ed- educational film. It was actually Ian McKellen that suggested that we we film it as a film because we'd done the play version and because it was by David Garrick and very little is sort of done on him so that's sort of why we did that um but then the and that is I mean sort of was fairly hard to sell uh, <laughs> then we moved on to two down and two down was our kind of what we call our calling card because it was our the one that we wrote from scratch again it was sort of like it was a dark it's a dark comedy thriller but we weren't we didn't really know how the industry you know sort of worked we weren't really talking about the two distributors until after we'd completed it well i suppose the thing is though because we it, it's very sort of 70s-esque which is sort of you know the films that i particularly like you know they're sort of slow burning um you know there's lots of it's, it's not the quick sort of pace stuff it's kind of you know actors in a room sort of talking um which has a certain audience but that that audience realistically tends to be older, um, mm. and there's not as many of them there were before. So that so in that case, you know, that sort of point of view, it's, people love the film. It's pretty well reviewed and got lots of awards and festivals and things like that. But realistically, because of the I think the type of film it was and the pacing, it's not hugely for a current audience. Well, so yeah. as in, you know, yeah. it, we didn't look at the films or the, the type of projects that were happening at the time. And I know it sounds like really mercenary, but but if you look, you know, there are bubbles all the time. There are trends of what sort of films come about. Yeah. And then this is kind of going away from, I suppose, the filmmakers, what we should be as in creating the things that we, we want to yeah. do. But that, that, I think there's just a balance. I think, yeah, you because know, there was a, it was sort of teetering on the edge of the kind of gangster um, sort of, and that's very much where distributors wanted to push it, wanted yeah, to package British it. British gangster. You know, that's what British gangster, there was the whole slew of them that came out and, you know, they were very popular. Or it was on the kind of action thriller side, but then there wasn't it's, enough it's, action. No, it's for more it. sort of the, uh, the conversation in the 70s, yeah. Francis Ford Coppola, lots of wandering around and talking and not a lot of action. Three people sitting in a room talking. Um, he just happens to be a hitman. I think we're still we're incredibly proud of Two Down and it, oh, it, yeah. for me it's sort of I like, think as as a, as a piece of filmmaking, even though it's officially one of our first ones, I think it's yeah, we really stand yeah. up as a film. So I think there's definitely something to be said for kind of, you know, it's like sticking it by a by your guns and kind of going, no, actually this is this is the vision that we want for the film and and this is how we're gonna do it. Because because we did that and actually it opened up loads yeah. of doors for us. And it meant that we then went in to see Great Point Media to talk to them about what other projects we had. And they were the ones that actually dictated our next project because they were the finance behind the aisle, a majority of it. Um, they wanted, we actually went in to pitch them a completely different film, which was a heist film with drag queens. And they were like, ah, oh, we're kind of wanting horror. Have you got anything? And we were well, like, genre, I mean, genre, 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 genre always um, sells. You know, maybe a ghost story. And we were like, well, we sort of have an idea maybe. about this island. We haven't quite finished it. Um, so that's so they were the ones that were like, yes, that sounds like Victorian horror. And again, that's a very it's it's, but it's also not sort of horror horror. No, there's no, there's no gore. It's again, it's sort of very much like the older sort of films where most of the spooky stuff sort of happens in your mind, or you're like, is it happening? It's so burn. Which is very much the sort of stuff that I um, and we we sort of like watching, yeah. but again, it's um, and I'm yeah I'm happy with that, how it sort of came out. But I suppose it, we could have if we thought more about the audience, yeah. especially the international audience. Like in America, yeah. 
for example, you know, they like the, the gore side of things, you know, and a bit more of the a bit more horror, blood. horror, a bit more blood. Yeah. Um, well, rather, some blood. There's some, no blood. Exactly, yeah. yeah. You know, if, if we thought a little bit more like producers, yes. um, I think at the beginning, then maybe it would have, I mean, it was, ends up being released in cinemas in America and yeah, things, yeah, but yeah, I think yeah, it would have well. had a bigger life, maybe, or... Yeah, yeah I think, yeah. But but just it, finding that balance. But, but I yes, think subsequently, but now then, yeah. we are in the, at, the, at the moment in the process of talking to several distributors um, and very much with, you know, with the idea that we have a whole slate of projects that we're working on and they are kind of coming in from the very beginning to to offer advice as to sort of you know which direction yeah, like, they'd want it to go elements in. of the story that maybe okay maybe this is just maybe not a way to go down but if you can bring in these elements of it and we, and we don't the thing is we don't really know what the answers are because each film will be different but it's also what each distributor go look we know because every distributor is different so blue finch who took on the infinite and they're very good at sci-fi stuff so they're looking at a couple of sci-fis but because we want it to be positioned maybe in a slightly bigger world than Infinitum, they might help say, look, these films, realistically, we can sell, we can do well with these. So let's take it down this route a little bit more. So mm -hmm. we're, we're being not as precious with the script when we send it to them um, so they can come in and we can... Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, talk about stuff. I mean, yeah. obviously, there's the cast side of things as well. But. Well, yeah, but I think what someone was saying the other day is that sales distributors are either the first in or the last in, you know, so, and they were sort of advising, and this was someone that works in distribution, um, you know, either get them in from the beginning and work with them at, at script level or make your movie, you know, the way that you want to, but being clever with, you know, knowing who your audience is and then, mm. and then, you know, get the right sales or distribution attached, you know, once it's completed. Yeah, I suppose because we never really, we always made the films that we wanted to make, which obviously, you know, we, we, ha we should, but, you know, to have a sort of sustainable career and not, you know, the statistics of how many British filmmakers make even two films, let alone three or four, is, you know, it's, it's frightening. And I think a lot of the time it's because, People go and make these passion projects, which are fantastic, but if it's not enough to kind of go and get the second one or people slogging away for, for 10 years, I think filmmakers just need to find the balance between direct, you know, creative and producer. Like, mm. how, can we actually sell this? And to be honest, you know, you, you want your investors, to, even if it's a tiny amount, you want your investors to get their money back so then you can go back again or you can go to the other investors and say, look, they made their money back. At the very least, yeah. they got their money back. You know, and I know it sounds, you know, sort of mercenary, but filmmaking, even if it's tiny budget, still, you still need money, you know, to do it. Even if you get to the, the film festival part to submit and do PR stuff, it just, it all costs money. You know? It's like with any job, it is your responsibility to be informed with how that world, how that industry is working and what's popular, what's selling, you know, it doesn't matter. You're, you're basically an entrepreneur when you're trying to be a filmmaker because yeah. you're trying to make a product that people are going to want to buy. And is there a market for that? And it's, it's approaching your films with that mindset, but also applying whatever message or theme or approach you have to storytelling into that at the same time. Um, and I think when you find that balance, it's such a beautiful sweet spot, which I guess you guys have found because you've done so many at this point, you've kind of, you're, you're finding your feet, but you're, you're able to both sell to your distributors and you're happy to adapt to their their feedback and then continue through with your, with your creative project. I suppose it is, uh, it took us a while to kind of know that, you know, it's like on a film set, you know, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't start dictating what how the sound should be recorded or the, the lighting of things. I have an opinion, of course, so, so it's collaboration, but also, you know, the, the people who are very good at their job, you should let them get on with their job. And that's the same with distribution and, and the sales side of things. Like at the end of the day, you have to trust that they know what they're doing. It is they're the experts at it, and we are certainly not. So there has to be um, that level of trust both ways that you know we'll provide them something they can sell but this is also that they they know how to sell it therefore they need a product yeah that they believe in and that they can go and sell yeah but also just to be a devil's advocate go on then. there are also so many companies out there and some brilliant sales agents and distributors oh, and I know some it less brilliant <laughs> yes you know that's... so it's also about kind of like doing your research as well and, and not yeah. and not being afraid to kind of ask other filmmakers have you know look at the titles that they've got 
Um, and then contact the filmmakers of those titles and just get, you know, get just ask them, get their opinion of like, you know, were you happy with these guys? Or, you know, how do you think they handled your film? Um, because it is your baby and you put so much effort and so much time and so much energy into it. And, and you know, and all the whole creative process and that whole team that's helped you create your, you know, your, your, your baby and like and I think so often we hear of people who just you know have been so disappointed with mm. how their film's been handled um and so yeah just to just to beat the devil's out no no but you're that. right yeah even that, <laughs> even just because of this because you do get excited this goes oh, look, I love your yeah. film I'm gonna take it I'm gonna get it to all, all the countries and all these different platforms which is great and of course you know as we did we're like oh great thank you very much but then you've you've just got to do that due diligence, due diligence right from the beginning yeah yeah, no, it's a really good point. And just something that is communicated to everyone at a really early stage of their filmmaking lives is even if a distributor says they like it, it doesn't mean you're going to get your money back. You have to be very cautious of it. Like you said, there's also a lot of really good ones out there. So don't just write them all off and be like, oh, they're all bad, all this kind of stuff. And I think that's a really good point you said in communicating with other people and just uh, getting the uh, the feel for <laughs> Yeah. particular well, one. Different distributors have different specialities though. Like yeah, I said, Blue Finch, I mean, they do other things as well, but like, you know, they know that they're very good with sci-fi. You know, they might not, I'm sure they are, but they, they might not be very good with a comedy, for example. I'm sure they're excellent. I'm sure they're excellent, of course, if you're listening. Like, <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it, everyone, like filmmakers have different things they're good at, you know, distributors. And territories as well, you know, it's, so yes. it's all about relationships. You know, it's the same with any agent, an acting agent, a writing, writing agent, director agent. You know, they have the contacts and the relationships with the casting directors. Likewise, a, a sales agent for films will have, you know, contacts that are really strong in Germany, say, but perhaps actually they don't have that many contacts over in Central America. You know, so it's 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 all of all all of that of kind of like doing your research. And so maybe rather than kind of going just to one person and allowing them the full worldwide. Mm actually go okay when well, you know where it be like sort of ask them the questions of kind of like so where are you strong you know where, where around the world are your are your strong te territories you know and they should be able to answer you and if they say, say everywhere it's probably not true <laughs> to be fair well yeah unless it's someone <laughs> huge, but well, yeah. yes yeah yeah and the other point to sort of add on with that as well is whenever they say all media rights as well because there will be different specialities within different kinds of media like you'll have some distributors who are good at like educational some who are good at like i don't know dvd vod theatrical and so you can also disclose that in your contracts and you can siphon down yeah. who gets what so another good thing to to look out for and and check read up on your um your distributors and sales agents there too it's always the one that gets forgotten i got given a contract for um one of my features and uh, it was like worldwide rights uh, all media types and i was like uh no <laughs> it was 25 years 25 years Ooh. that's what it said on it 25 i think that it's a record that's normal yeah. yeah that's really but normal. i think also because they know that you're going to send it back and say no it's that, yeah. sort of, it's that old sales trick isn't it if you're going to go for the big number they probably <laughs> only asked everything. about 10 and then so you you yeah, mm. bring it down go, oh all right then we'll ask you for 10. your first yeah. ball and then <laughs> we'll yeah, from exactly. that. yeah, yeah. You've worked with a lot of well-known British actors. Uh, for like filmmakers who are just getting started, it must be quite intimidating to try and do that or reach out to them in the first place. So, how do you go about bringing them on board with your projects, and how would you say having them affects the distribution stage? So, I mean, we so with people like Ian McKellen, we were lucky to to know Ian because from from days of acting, to be honest, um, and the same with Connor. I was in the play with him. Um, but also, uh, but other people as well. You know, um, it was just a matter of emailing, even though it was Connor and things. You know, um, we still had to sort of go. Would you like to be in in this film? That sort of mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and we you know, we know lots of actors as well. Like, actors like acting, um, and you know, they. I suppose what we always say, especially when you're beginning um, with, with things, if you've got like a four week shoot or something, even though it sounds like oh, no, I've got this amazing part where you'll be in it for four weeks. That's a big commitment for, you know, okay, but, you know, our, our budget is 50 grand. It's a big commitment from a big actor. Even if they lo love you and they love the project, trying to get that past their agents and their manager and their lawyer, you know, all the team is very hard. But if if you can go, look, it's two days of filming. There's just like a little, there's a few, you know, a few scenes for you, 10 minutes of the film. They're more likely to, to, to not, they're not definitely going to say yes, but they're more likely to look at it if it's a smaller amount of time. I think people often sort of go go on the kind of creative side, which makes sense. Again, mm. say, look, this is an amazing part. Great. 
how much of my time is this going to take up? Because, you know, the Ian McKellens of the world are you know, getting scripts sent every day and every one of those films could, you know, is going to be massive or you know, do, do big things. So it's just trying to go, well, I've got to, actually, I've got a couple of days free. All right, I can, I can sort of fit that in. You know, and actors like doing things. Yeah. And they also, you know, um, they like working with nice, interesting people as well, to be honest, as well as like finding new people. Um, uh, just being in sort of a nice... Um, individual really helps. I know that sounds that sounds crazy, but like you know, we get we get like I'm trying to skirt around things because we get some things a lot, a lot of the time, and sometimes they're you know quite abrupt, and they're not really kind of doing the whole sort of not they have to be o- overly polite, but just you know courteous yeah. and you know sort of and also showing interest in someone else, and you know so you know, when you approach someone not kind of jumping sort of straight in and being like I've got this brilliant project and you should definitely be in it but kind of uh, you know sort of off not sort of necessarily but just kind of you know engaging in 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 pe- with, with people first um and having a genuine interest in in them I think I think Helps. Yeah, so a knowledge of their work as and well. Knowledge so for of actors their work, as well, rather than just yeah. going, okay, you're famous and that would really help. So yeah. But this is this part, which is a bit like this, but I think you'd be really I thought good you were for... great in this, and and that's why I thought of you immediately for this. I wrote this, you know, part for you. You know, I mean flattery gets you a long way. It really does, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Um, a little bit of homework and what in their work and what they've done. Yeah. Um something similar. Or, yeah, but also I mean, because agents obviously, so the bigger actors obviously have to go through agents a lot of the time. Um, but you know it is it is entirely possible to do that, especially if it's kind of a smaller mm. amount of time. You go, look, this is a project. A lot of actors, especially if they're in between projects, they like you know they, they like kind of keeping going. To be honest, as well, a lot of actors don't like sitting around doing nothing. It's just being brave, to be honest, isn't it? I yeah, think. yeah. Um, I think, and also being um, smart with the kind of project and who you're approaching for it. Um, so, you know, look at their previous work, look at the type of stuff that they like to do. Mm. Is this something that actually, yes, they, they, you know, they might well be interested in, or is it like a completely, you know, wild card, which you can tend to kind of get a vibe of the sort of work that, you know, actors like to do. And also I think don't, you don't always have to have a name. So of course a name helps. And yes, 100%, it will help with distribution and sales. Always, the first question is who's in it. Well, who, who's going to be on the poster? Oh, yes. We learned that from Lionsgate many years ago. Like, <laughs> yeah, but who's on the poster? On the that's poster. the main thing that a lot of them, yeah, that's, it's all about the artwork, the visuals. Who, yeah. who, how can we sell this, really? But if you are making a low budget horror film, mm-hmm. names don't matter. Like, it's a really weird one. Or genre in general. Yeah, really. genre in general. You don't have to have. They're not. The sales aren't led by names. If it's a drama, they are. Yeah. They're one hundred percent led by names. But if it's you know, if it's a um, a cabin in the woods kind of you know, like yeah. it's 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 not led by names, and so therefore you know, perhaps don't waste your time getting a casting director on board who's then going to try you know and, and sort of and get some names that actually in the best sense it, like aren't actually that bankable anyway so you, you I think quite a lot of filmmakers waste some money and some time sort of like going through this whole casting process where they're trying to attach sort of names to projects that projects actually might not need names for. Um, and I think quite often if you go to a distributor um, before you get to a casting director stage and just speak to them about this is a project, might you be interested in it? What kind of a cast might help this? Because um, you, you might just be surprised and they might go, actually, you know what? It's that it's, it's genre. It's not cast that, you know, it, someone who maybe has a name in the horror world could help um and sometimes you can be really surprised about like who the the actors that they're excited about might be totally different Mm. to the actors who your casting director is excited about at the end of the day though you want sort of good actors but like you can always go um get in contact with the um casting assistant so they are going to become the casting directors they want to make a name for themselves as well so actually this is sort of a small sort of project that they can do on the side as well and say look this is the thing we just want a couple of, you know, some 
fairly decent yeah. sort of actors or you know well, you want these actors and the whole thing you know they they might help you for for no money to be honest they want to get the credit uh, you know actual casting credit mm -hmm. as well they also have access to two actors as well yeah. so they know their availability if you go look we, we kind of want a bit of a bigger name it's just two days they have it in front of them as well i think that's kind of an interesting way of um sort of going things and it's just it's just the emergency to be honest being brave um and saying just being honest as well that thing don't don't make things up or lie. Just go, look, this is the budget. This is how long it's going to take. This is the truth. They'll either say yes or no. Say no, fine. Oof, next one. And there's no shame in going, look, this is my first feature. Um, I want some help on this. I love a couple of actors. Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And like you said, like being being nice and being humble about it all is such a, a good way of like getting people on board in general. Um, and, and that, that level of honesty is so, so important. And you have to work with nice people. It's, yeah, it's a hard enough job as it is. All of that advice was top tier, like absolute top tier for everyone there. Was, <laughs> it was really, every, everything you said, I was like, amazing, amazing. <laughs> that was so good. Um, yeah, and, and stuff that people don't hear enough. So that is awesome. Thank you for sharing that. If there was one piece of filmmaking advice you could give the younger you, what would it be? Oh, that's a very good question, Sam. Yeah. It always stumps everyone, this one. So <laughs> I it's cruel. It's cruel. It's really tricky because I think for me personally, I wish I had understood the producing side of things more uh, as a director and as a writer to understand um, the mechanics of everything. And I, I think it's sort of, it's basically what we spoke about, to be honest. It's, it's understanding the end parts it's the distribution the pr and that sounds i thought well that's someone else's job and in theory it is but to understand at least understand have an understanding of how that works i might have made some different decisions maybe a little bit more intelligently mm. i think um and that sounds really callous because it should be about creativity but the creativity needs to be sort of channeled and i think um i needed a bit more channeling i think at the beginning I think mine, mine is a piece of advice that I'm, I'm giving myself on a daily basis still. <laughs> um, but I would definitely give it to my younger self just so I could get a head start on it. Um, but to, to um, write myself uh, more interesting characters, like don't give the really good stuff to everyone else. Um, like I have this kind of real habit where I'm writing and I'm like, the male characters are great and they've got all the really interesting stuff you know and then like the character that I'm writing myself is just sort of not as interesting or kind of so I think I think just kind of <laughs> I don't know it's something about being braver um and putting not being afraid to really lay yourself vulnerable um and and open um take and, risks yeah and take risks especially at the beginning it's the time that you really can yeah and i think it's still something that i'm very much kind of trying to learn and tell myself every day the great thing about films if something doesn't work you can just take it out take the risk rather than yeah. in hindsight go oh which we done that. don't read reviews that's mm. another thing as well it's, mm. it can't even if they're good or bad just ignore them because there's nothing you can do about it yeah you know and, and realistically you'll have probably learned whatever you're going to learn by the time reviews come, come in out. as well and these days, you know, the internet is a, a mad, slightly evil. The issue as well, which is the main thing, which is similar to what you said with Infinitum, is the way that that was sort of marketed and posted was this very kind of grandiose sci-fi, super big budget. And then because they've been misled, they then take it out on the film because they went in expecting something else. But it's, yeah, they yeah, tend yeah. to do that with low budget things. That's the thing, low budget mm -hmm. films, no matter how good they are, always get certain group of people who will just go ah oh, this isn't marvel size budget sort of thing yeah. and we just have to go oh, yeah well i yeah, know i haven't got that budget let's but, yeah. Yeah. move on it is exactly. it's a very interesting point it's one that we've been sort of um grappling with is you know that it's how far you let the distributor because at the end of the day you want to make your money back you want to sell your film because you want your investors to get their money back but then how far do you let your distributor go, you know, mm. sell it as an epic big budget number just from like, and the image, the poster is like, so it's, it's what sells it, you know, it's, it's what, it's what, um, well, D DVDs, yeah, like, so the DVD people, um, which I know sounds old fashioned, but you still make money from DVDs and Blu-rays and things like that as well. Um, especially in supermarkets, 
So the DVD people don't ever look, they don't watch, watch the, the film. film, they don't even watch the trailer. They go, what is your artwork? And they will take it on that because they, they'll go to a supermarket, lay out a piece of A4 paper, and they'll just go, yeah, we'll have this one, this one, this one. That's how they buy it. And that's how they've sort of sold it. So it has to be, it's got to be of a certain, it's got to yeah. be eye-catching, you know, and, you, and there's the part of your brain which goes, this has to happen. So our investor can get the money back, but we are going to get so much. Stuff. But the backlash from, yeah, from, from people being like, this is not what yeah. I was buying. It's, yeah, it's a tricky mm. one. We don't know what the answer is yet for that. It's just, a, I think it's a preference thing. You know, how much do you, do you want that? The people to know you for your work being targeted appropriately. It's like when you, when you if you ever did like Facebook ad stuff when you're trying to decide do you want reach or do you want quality of engagement and uh, yeah. you know, kind of like decide the same way I suppose <laughs> what is next for you and where can people find you so next for us is a good question because because infinitum or infinitum um has opened up a lot of doors you know it's probably one of our it's smallest films but it's sort of um had I suppose the biggest reach for, you know, from press wise and things like that so distributors have got in touch um, so we have a couple with one distributor who does sort of sci-fi, and then we have a couple who wanted sort of more dramery sort of stuff as well. So um, realist and other distributors who are looking at other sort of things as well. So realistically, it's going to be whatever people pick first. Yeah. What we've learned is don't just have one project, <laughs> have lots of different ones because you don't know if they're going to go for the heist film and drag queens or they're going to go to the ghost story on an island. So we don't know. We have yeah interest in and next project of ours, what that will be, watch this space. Stuff's in the works, which sounds exciting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. awesome. And uh, where can people find you if they want to follow you and things like that? Uh, so if you, if you put in Fizz and Ginger on most of the things, you'll you'll find us one way or another. They can find you on Twitter and Instagram, and they'll be in the links below. And you've got your website, which is uh, fizzandgingerfilms.com. Is that right? .co.uk and also .com works yeah oh, great well thank you very much for joining me on this it's been very enlightening uh, and uh, hopefully will be to those who watch as well but I thought it was uh, yeah really really great answers there and very useful for for young upcoming creators and producers and things like that so thank you that was really thank cool thank you so much thanks so much for having me yeah. thank you for joining us be sure to leave a like and subscribe if you are an indie filmmaker who is innovating the film industry send me a message on social media at Seb Cox Films on Instagram or Twitter if you want to check out my work you can go to sebcox.com but for now I'll see you next time